Uh, I think this is my 10th or 11th year that I've spoken for UFC in the first week in January, or prior to the January report. Um, as always, I start out with a joke. So, an Italian, an Irishman, and an Englishman all happened to die at the exact same instant, about a week ago. And they show up at the pearly gates all at the same time. St. Peter says, hey guys, just like down in Earth, right after Christmas, we have a, a big sale going on up here, a big special. If you show me something Christmas related, you get to come into heaven free. We don't look at anything on the books. We don't see what you did in your life. We, you just get to come on in. So actually, the, the Englishman, you died first by a nanosecond. So show me something about Christmas so I can let you in free. Wow, the, the Englishman's digging through his pockets and he's looking, pulls out his car keys. And he starts ringing. He goes, St. Peter, this is a Christmas bell. And Peter says, oh, nice imagination. Yeah, come on in. The uh, Italian was next. And, he, and uh, he looks at the Italian and, and the Italian says, oh, every Italian smokes cigarettes. If you've ever been to Italy, you'll, you'll, you'll learn that. And so he knew what he wanted. He went digging around. Finally, he found his lighter. And he lit the lighter and he said, St. Peter, look at a Christmas candle, huh? And St. Peter said, yeah, come on in. Now the Irishman. He died after a night of a little bit too much debauchery. And uh, he was really having trouble. He's digging in all his pockets, his coat, and he's rumbling around. And he, he's about to give up. With it. Oh. And he reaches down into his inside pocket and he pulls out a pair of women's panties. And St. Peter looks at him and says, yeah? And he says, hey, St. Peter, these are carols. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, now I gotta figure this out. I got glasses on and I probably have this one. The first thing I need to go over is the legal disclaimer. It basically says, that you can lose money trading options and futures. I know, it's a shock, but you can. Uh, it says it right here in print. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. If I've been out here a number of years and I've given you some good advice and really been uh, helpful to you, doesn't mean it's gonna work this year. Might be good advice, I, I think it is. I, I, everything I'm presenting, I believe to be reliable and true uh, and from good sources. So we'll just go from there. I'm gonna be different this year. Let's talk about relationships. Huh? Everybody likes to look at Brad and Angelina, right? No, really, we're, we're gonna talk about relationships this year. I'm serious. But we're not gonna talk about political relationships or Hollywood relationships. What we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about price relationships in basic commodities. And we're gonna use a couple different analytical tools to do that. We're gonna look at positive and negative price correlations, and we're gonna use historical charts and data to support our argument. And I think you're gonna find it rather compelling. First of all, a definition. Two commodities are said to have a positive correlation if their prices tend to move together in the same direction, up or it's at the same time they move down. Conversely, those commodities would have a negative correlation if the price of one moves up while the other one moves down. So they move in opposite directions. The closer that two markets move in the same direction, obviously the higher the, the uh, positive correlation, the same, if, if it's almost always one is down and the other is up, that would make sense, that's the stronger type of a negative correlation. So I think we all got that. It only makes sense. Complementary goods have extremely strong positive correlations. And by that, things like cattle, how often do you see cattle up 200 points? You go, I don't even have to turn on the screen, I know the feeder cattle are gonna be up. You know, that, that, that makes sense. Same with gold and silver. Same with crude oil and heating oil. Same with soybeans and soybean meal. Anybody see soybeans up 20 cents and meal is, is lower? No. But these aren't the things that give us clues to what might be going on in the market 
and a significant potential move occurring in the market. What it is, is we need to look at unrelated commodities, base commodities, that have extremely strong positive or negative correlations. So the first one we're going to talk about, the highest positive correlation, and again, maybe I can see, oh, I did. Highest positive correlation between two unrelated commodities is corn and crude oil. You think about that a little bit, both are extremely broadly traded throughout the world. <coughs> both of them are reflections of the general economy. Think about the industries we're talking about, agriculture, and we're talking about energy, two of the biggest econ or separate economies in, in our economy inside of it. And outside markets oftentimes can cause similar price strength or price weakness for corn and crude. The highest negative correlation between two unrelated commodities also includes corn. Over 80% of the time on both of these things, they move in the same direction. But this is with the US dollar. So typically, if you see the US dollar moving higher and you see corn moving lower, that's what happens. That's, that's what it is. Um, it makes sense. You know, the dollar rallies, it becomes much more expensive to buy our corn. We sell less, our surplus grows, you know, it's a negative price action indicator. So that's something you would expect to see. I want you, it's, I'm sorry about the background color, it doesn't show up well, but this says the worst net farm income in the last 50 years occurred when the dollar made significant highs. <coughs> Anybody farming in 85, 86? Obviously, I, I knew there would be some hands. Thank you. <laughs> that was the year the dollar made its highest level in the last 50 years. Must just be a coincidence, right? No. Because in 2002, the last time we traded corn under two bucks an acre, or two dollars a bushel, the dollar was making a spike high, a significant spike high. So let's examine this relationship between crude and, and, and corn and the dollar. This is a chart. This light blue color here is corn. Whoops. And the colorful one here is crude is, oh, this is the US dollar, excuse me. So I said they have a, a strong negative correlation. And, and this was borne out here at the beginning. We, we can see that the dollar has been going very, very rapidly higher since last April, May, okay? And as the dollar went up, sure as heck, corn was coming down. But we got to October 1st. All of a sudden, something was wrong in the universe because the price of corn started going straight up. And it's been going up ever since. It's climbed and climbed and climbed. And it's has a lot of people that are a heck of a lot smarter than I am in Chicago and New York and other places scratching their heads, trying to figure out how can this be? It doesn't make any sense. So again, now they're looking, they're moving parallel to one another. They're looking like they're very strong positive relationship. <coughs> but we know that for the last 50 years, it's the strongest of negative correlations. If we look at the crude oil, Crude and, the, and corn should be moving together. Crude oil's going down and down and down and down. Corn's going down and down. And again, October 1st, corn starts going straight up and crude oil drops from, what is this, about 84 bucks down to right now. I made this slide four days, five days ago. It was at $55, 48 bucks today at the close. $48 on crude. Normally, if, if you're looking at crude taking, literally just tearing chunks off its price every day. The price of corn is getting slammed. Something isn't right here. I'll show you the positive correlation between the two. On These are monthly charts as opposed to the previous one being a daily chart. So each line represents a month in time. The absolute highest price crude oil ever hit was the same month in, 19, in 2008 that we set new record hysterical, historical highs in corn. 
They both, they peaked at the exact same time. They both came down sharply and made a significant low in 2009, where corn had backed off back under three bucks, and crude went from 144 a barrel down to $36 a barrel. And then they both turned and they raced higher again into 2011, making their highs exactly again on the same month. There was a, a blip where it, they didn't go together. Crude oil was dropping at this time, and all of a sudden we had a, a two month time frame in 2012 where the corn market rallied two and a half dollars in a two month time. Anybody remember 2012? We were looking for about 155 bushel an acre yield at the beginning of that month. By the end of the next month, we were we had a 122 yield. I mean, 122, that's that's a, a huge thing. We had to ration corn and we had to do it right now. And that's that's what caused that. But since that time, they were both coming down together again <coughs> until three months ago. Let's examine why. Let's try and figure that out. So since October the 1st, we've, we've had corn rally over 80 cents a bushel. The same time, crude has had one of its biggest sell-offs ever in a three-month period. It's like $52 uh, a barrel now. Somebody had parked in front of the garage door over here. And the chef needs to get out with his vehicle. He's parked in there. It's a white Chevy pickup. If I can get you to move it quick, I appreciate it. Sorry for interrupting. No problem. Perfect. So, again, this, guys, this is something that, that is really important. This is going to be really important to you over time. You're going to, you're going to want to be able to see is this relationship changed forever or is this a real temporary situation as it makes a huge difference to the price of corn and beans? Which move is right? Looking <coughs> at those charts, we must have a shortage of corn in this country, right? No, actually we're, we have a nine year high. We haven't had this much excess stocks in nine years. So that's not right. Well, maybe it's South America. Maybe there's a huge problem in South America. All we hear from South America is everything is good. It continues good. It continues along the way they want to see it. So that's not the situation. It's, it's not something in corn. Well, maybe it's something with the, the, the dollar or crude oil. If, if you read the leading economists on crude oil, the, the earliest any of them see a bottom in the, in the crude that I'm reading, I read all kinds of these guys, Wall Street guys, they're talking about the second quarter of this year as the earliest, but many of them think that it won't be until 2016 before we see crude make any kind of a meaningful recovery. So no, it's not the crude oil. Let's, let's look at some dollar fundamentals. The dollar rate now is one of the very most bullish currencies in the world, if not the most, <coughs> our economy is really clicking. Employment rates, housing, all those things that were in such terrible shape look so much better. It better look better, guys. In the last six years, you and I have spent 17 trillion with a T dollars that we don't have. We've manufactured them, created it out of thin air, and that's all we're going to get. And our great, great, great grandkids will still not have paid off this debt. There's no way it will ever get paid off. We'll be having something called the new dollar when there's the new euro, and because all these countries are doing the same thing. So I, I don't know how that's going to end. And that's a different seminar for a different day. Right now, um, with a strong economy, we're going to have to raise interest rates this year. Most, most people expect it in the second quarter. It might be the third quarter. If you raise your interest rates, that's going to cause more people to put in their currency or whatever, their assets, into dollar-backed denomination. Now, that's not going to help. The dollar is going to continue to go up. Europe is a train wreck in a, in a number of these countries right now. And any OPEC member, anybody from Nigeria, Venezuela, oil-producing countries like that, many of them are teetering on the edge of bankruptcy just this quickly from this oil situation. Um, you know, I've talked with other folks about this uh, 
I, I read some smart guy who says what really is going on is is the uh, NATO members and others kind of put together with the Saudis, they're going to put Mr. Putin out of business. That's why oil prices have fallen as rapidly as they have, and they keep it down for a bit, and believe you me, it will put them out of business. That country is in very deep financial problems right as we speak. But no, it isn't, it isn't a problem. The dollar is expected, again, by world leading economists to gain more this coming year in 2015 than it gained last year. That's a great concern to me, all right? Because <laughs> here's, here's the dollar. It went up 12 big points from 79 up to, well, it's, I think it's about 93 today. Again, this chart's a few days old, so it just keeps climbing. It's breaking out. Here's the last bit. Whoop. I'm trying to be careful. Here's the last big spike in 2002. <coughs> My wife's an RN. She works in the hospital. She brings home all kinds of wonderful things. <laughs> I said, honey, I'm speaking next week. You know, go sleep in the other room. No. <laughs> So, so I was on the garage floor, and that's where I got the, the sleeper, so that's where I got the <laughs> But $2 coins, you know, 1985-86. Anybody remember that? Willie and Waylon and everybody were out there playing concerts for Farm Aid, because there wasn't going to be a farmer left in America. It isn't coincidental that the dollar made a record high here had made a record high in, in that year. And if we come up in here where people are talking about 110 is a number I've read, I've read other numbers, everybody gets a guess and that's all it is. But this is important to understand this and, and recognize and realize I need to be planning this year. I need to be forewarned about this and, and now I need to take action. <clears throat> Let's give you the answer why these two things have changed. <coughs> this relationship for three months has changed. Let's talk about the funds. These guys were the biggest investors in crude oil and in precious metals and in, in the energy complex of anyone, all right? They were major shorts in, into October in corn, huge shorts, 240,000 contracts short. Today they're long significant amounts of corn and beans. And they did the flip-flop because they looked around and they said, we took all this money out of energies, they had to, they knew what, they could see what was happening. And now you've got literally billions of dollars and you've got to put it somewhere. What commodity did you want to go? Did you, you want to go buy cattle? Cattle was sitting at record highs. In fact, the majority of base commodities were in the upper one third of their trading range. And many of them were, you know, the, the ones that might've been attractive are too thin to trade. And then they looked at corn and they looked at soybeans and they said, gee, you know, look at these prices. They're less than half of what they were two years earlier. We can buy some of this stuff and eventually, because they can hold it for years if they need to, but eventually there's going to be a too hot, too much, too rain, too, too whatever, and the crop will be in, in jeopardy somewhere and you get a sharp, sharp price appreciation. So I believe the answer to the quandary is, what are funds doing? And what are they gonna to expect to do is the next uh, big question. What, are the, what, what type of move will they make here now? January 8th, happens to be tomorrow, through January 14th this year is what is called asset redistribution by funds. They look at all their positions. They say, what's worked, what's made us money, what should we add to, and what should we come out of? I have an analyst in Chicago who, who tells you what they, he thinks they're going to do down to very minute numbers. He says funds will liquidate 18,641 contracts in this coming week in corn. And he believes they are going to put it right back into the energies because the energies are under 50 bucks a barrel. It would make sense. If you could hold them for years, you know some nut job terrorist is going to go blow something up somewhere and it's going to get people excited and that's when energy costs can sometimes skyrocket $10, $15 a barrel in, in a day or two. So my advice or my, my belief, 
is that we are going to see a redistribution, and that might be enough to help tip this market over. We've got a report comes Monday during the middle of this redistribution. A lot of stuff hitting this market, a lot of things going on. So again, I would thank your host at UFC for having a meeting like this because if you're not where you want to be in marketing, you yeah, have a few days now to get to talk to some folks and look for some ideas of, of things you might do. One other thing that, that fund managers were starting to state a case, they were trying to say that, no, 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 <coughs> things have changed. <coughs> Excuse me. They were saying that, that right now, grains are starting to act more like currencies. They become a currency, like in Brazil, the real. If you're a Brazilian farmer, every single day the real goes down against the dollar. And why did that, does that matter? Because when you sell your beans in Brazil, you're, you're based on the US price and they convert it into reals. So it's a huge windfall for them. While we've gone up a buck 40 in beans since October 1st, they've gone up something like $3 and, and some cents. They can, it, it also was a huge incentive to plant as many acres into beans this year as they possibly could. They've got the, the world's <coughs> largest soybean crop ever is gonna be harvested in, in real earnest starting about uh, February 1st in South America. So competition, competition, competition. There are more soybeans in existence today on January 7th than on any January 7th ever in history. There are more beans in the world right now than there's ever been, right? I mean, last year was a record, record crop in South America. Last year was a record, record crop in the United States. This year is a record, record crop in South America. Hmm. It's a lot of soybeans, folks, a lot of soybeans. Fund ownership of soybeans or of corn makes them no more valuable in the long run. It can cause a price distortion and funds could continue to buy for a few more months. I mean, I, I don't have, nobody tell, calling me up from a fund manager, and, hey, yeah, we're gonna buy some more. I don't know if they are or aren't. But, but what I do know is that what really changes prices over time and what is able to hold prices over time is supply and demand. We have a massive supply. There's no threat to it right now. So supply isn't gonna help. And I gotta say, demand is not improving nearly at anywhere near a, a pace to take care of this excess amount of beans that we have in the world. So the conclusion of, of this little section on, on price relationships, corn and bean prices were greatly benefited from the fund buying in the fourth quarter. Longer term price historical relationships will be maintained. In other words, we're gonna go back to where corn goes down when crude goes down. And when the dollar goes up, corn goes down. Be prepared for that. So in looking at what has happened because of of the funds, both crude oil and the dollar suggest the potential for sharply lower egg prices. It's a huge concern I have for my customers that this is gonna have a real debilitating effect on prices over time, unless we have a big problem in production this summer. And I'm not smart enough to know that, only the good Lord knows that. <clears throat> Don't allow this price increase gift from the funds to be wasted. I've told guys at the other meetings, I say, hey, if you meet a fund manager, if you're like down in Chicago for some reason, probably on your way to Hawaii and you're flying weird or something, you meet a fund manager, give them a big hug. Give them a big thank you because these guys have given you an opportunity to market grain at a profit rate now. You know, do you remember where they were October 1st? Did you like those prices? So. They really have done a huge, huge advantage. I, I liked the UFC thing that, that was up about uh, doing that ADM thing, you know? Another tool you can have. Do something here about this the huge excess we have. We'll get to your results uh, during the, the meeting of, of those sheets you filled out, but everywhere we go, all I can see from these numbers is you guys are holding more corn and soybeans this year 
than you've been holding ever before. And that concerns me, because sometimes that door gets real narrow when everybody's trying to get out of it at the same time. I would be using min-max contracts, uh, put options, do something to be setting a floor. I'm not selling futures contracts heavily right now, and, and I never do at this time of the year. All the twos are in front of us. It's too wet, it's too hot, it's too dry, it's too cold, whatever. That's where you get spikes, and, and Pete will talk more about some of that a little later anyhow. What about the report? Numbers are not that much different. Average guesses from what December we've been seeing. You know, everybody's reducing things a little bit, but the big question mark out there, the Farm Service Agency, FSA, versus USDA. And every year, that FSA has been compiling data on acres. How many acres were signed into all of the farm programs? Their number has always had a two and a half to three million acre less number than whatever USDA had. In December, the differential that they reported was 4.6 million acres. So there are people out there saying, we're gonna lose 1.6 to 2 million acres out of corn production on the January report. That, that could help justify some of what we've done in the, in the last three months on the upside. It, it, you know, if you took a, away a couple hundred million bushels of carry out, that, that would be a bullish factor. I don't believe that's gonna happen. I, I don't, I, uh, I might be wrong, but my, my case is anyhow, whether the stocks are 1.8 billion or whether we have two billion bushels of excess corn, they're too heavy, they're too burdensome, and it's gonna be very difficult to continue a rally. I don't, like I say, I don't care if it was 1.7. Yeah, you might get a, a week or a couple of three days of sharp rallies, and it'd be a better selling opportunity. So, FSA discrepancy with soybeans. They have a 2.55 million under USDA in the January or in the December report. <coughs> Usually that number's around <coughs> a million acres different. So, again, there are people trying to say we're gonna lose a bunch of acres. I think the FSA had their hands full this year for a variety of reasons. I would never wanna say that there's a government agency that is slow and has had data for five or six months and somehow couldn't put it together in this age of computers. But yeah, for whatever their excuse, however lame it is or not, they're, they're finally gonna be able to tell us in January how many of you guys signed up for programs you must have just signed up last month, right? Oh no. <laughs> yeah, they've had a long time to get this right. I don't know why it's, it's been such a difficult thing this year. Um, export sales on beans are slipping behind. They started out at, at an incredible rate. Now they're slipping behind. That, that is a concern as well. It's partially due to the dollar. You're not gonna buy beans from us unless you absolutely have to. That's, that's the way it is. The real drop versus the dollar makes it very attractive for Brazilian farmers to sell their beans sooner than what they have in, in recent years. You might see that happening, especially if they see our price coming down, because that, that will motivate them to do more. The bottom one here is what really, really makes me nervous. There are credible analysts. I'll name one name, Rich Feltis has said this. Um, I mean, he's, he's been Revco and now he's been RJO for years. Excellent analyst, very conservative man. He's not out there making crazy wild comments. Rich is saying that given what we're talking about and given the fact that most of you out here are intending to plant more soybeans next year than you have in the past, he's saying that we could easily see a 600 million bushel carryout in soybeans at the end of next year, at the end of this growing season. 600 million. In the 37 years I've been doing this, for the first 27 years, there was a 300 million bushel carryout number that was associated with eight bucks. If you were above 300 million in carryout, the price of beans was below eight bucks. If you were below it, it was reversed. If there wasn't 300 million, you'd be above eight bucks. World demand is greater than it had ever been. China alone accounts for that. And so we don't trade $8 with a 300 carryout because we already have a projection for 410 for this year. 
and we're not at eight bucks. But guys, there's a lot of stuff going on right here, isn't there? There's dollars going up, there's crude oil going down, and there's a potential for a carryout. If, if we don't have a problem with our weather this coming up year, can you bar the door? I don't, I don't want anybody in this room that hasn't done anything to take care of this situation sooner as opposed to later. You don't want to be selling $8 beans in the fall. A year ago today, March corn was 23 cents higher than where it is now. March wheat was 14 cents higher. And March soybeans were $2.55 higher than where they are right now. And Joe, you're gonna stand up here and say that the thing that you're most afraid about is soybeans? They've already dropped two and a half bucks. What are you doing? Yeah, I, I am. I'm very concerned about soybeans, much more so than about corn. If I have a little extra concern to go around, I'll put it on the corn. But really, it's, it's the soybeans, and especially for those of you who intend to plant more of them. <clears throat> Some numbers from the recent reports. In 2012, we planted 97.3 million acres of corn. Last year, we were down to 90.9. We'll see if that number drops on, on Monday's report. The yield in 2012 was 123.1. And two years later, you had 50 bushel an acre increase. We had a 173.4 yield. Trend line yield next year is 167. Those are big numbers. They create monster crops. So again, without a problem, Again, looking at, at production and usage, we went from a 10.7 crop, 10.7 billion bushels in 2012, to 14.4. Massive increase, a 25% increase in a very mature industry in a two year time frame. Huge. And usage, yeah, usage went up, and there are some people trying to say we're going to sell more, and the exports will help us do even more next year. I, I question that, but we'll see. Um, but it hasn't gone up nearly as quickly as these crop sizes. So that's why we're building these stocks. That's why there's two billion extra bushels of corn this year. That's a big number. I probably have said it's a big number enough times. You guys understand what I'm saying. Let's, let's figure out what we're gonna do about this though. Corn stocks from 2012, 821 was all that was left over. Guys were sweeping out the bins. And then, of course, you had uh, 1.23. We built it back up last year, and now it's it's close to that two billion figure. Yeah, I mean, the other thing last year, you had feed guys coming in. You had, you know, there were all kinds of reasons last year why in the first quarter of 2013, there was a whole bunch of corn used real quickly for feed. Maybe 300 million more bushels <coughs> that might get used for feed this year. So. There's all kinds of stuff that can pile on and make this worse. I hope it doesn't, but it, it could happen. We'll look at the beans briefly. 40 bushel an acre in 12 because of that problem. 47 and a half last year. Again, a wonderful increase. Almost a 25% increase in the size of the crop from 2012 to 2014. They're looking for almost as big a crop number next year because yields are going up and continue to go up. They're looking for 45 and a half as trend line now. So right here, I mean, these, that's a big number. That's a huge number. Lots and lots and lots of soybeans. Again, looking at the, the usage in the stocks, usage has gone up. It's gone up nicely in that time frame. And these stocks went all the way down to 92 million bushels in 2013. 410 this year, they'll revise this. I would be you know, somewhere in the 385 to 400 is probably Monday's report. Not, a, not a, enough of a change when you got that kind of number to make a difference. This is again the thing that scares the bejesus out of me. I don't want guys owning soybeans at harvest and with, that are unhedged or, or, you know, we need to do something about that. So again, with potential for massive ending stocks of soybeans, what is your plan? What is your plan? I think each and every one of you are going to get the benefit of hearing Mark Peterson 
give you some real good outlines <coughs> for some planning. <coughs> Everybody's different, everybody's plan's gonna be different, but Pete, I think uh, I'm, I'm ready to let you do it. Any questions? Oh yeah, any questions? I thought I explained it so well, there probably are. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, the, the, the price drop in crude could have caused worldwide deflation? It, it could, sir, was, was the price drop in crude, could that cause worldwide deflation? Yeah, that, it, that is a concern. That's definitely a concern of the central banks. Again, all the central banks are creating money there out of thin air as fast as they can. And because of the, the previous crisis, financial crisis, that is in that, now we're starting to see some growth, but yeah, that's definitely a concern. It's not a good thing for base commodities when one base commodity does a tank like that. It's a, it's a nasty thing. So that's a concern. Yes, sir. I'm not going to argue with your fund, you know, the fund ownership and, and sure. the impact it has on price. We know that that happens. But what about, what about you were going to say tight farmer, um, is the tight farmer holdings? You know, I thought that was something you mentioned. You know, that farmers are hanging on to their corn, and that's what's causing the price to go up. Farmers hanging on to the corn have a much greater impact on basis, in my opinion, than, than it would on overall long-term price. But yeah, that, that's, that's a legitimate thing, and, and we certainly saw it. But just as that tight holding by the farmer has helped the basis and some of these things hold together better than it might have been other years, when guys want to start getting out, ooh, like I say, that, then it's, it's, it's just something else that's going to add to the problem. Yes, sir? You talked about Russia being put out of business. What, what would the downside of that be if that would happen? Well, I'm not nearly smart enough to answer that question. <laughs> you know, I, I, I would say, it, it, when I say not Russia be put out of business, I think they want to get rid of Vladimir Putin and stop the Ukrainian situation and all of that. And this is working. They are hurting in this. I mean, the price of bread, 30 years ago in Russia, it took one ruble to buy a loaf of bread. Five years ago, it took 30 rubles to buy a price to a loaf of bread. Right now it's 80 rubles to buy a loaf of bread. Wow. You think you got you think you got this guy with millions, hundreds of millions of very unhappy consumers? You bet you do. And and the personal wealth of him and all of his friends are just being attacked at every turn. So you think they'd be on the streets with pitchforks pretty soon. Right? Well, they they couldn't. But you know, it, it's hard with a pitchfork against whatever the, the gun that the Kalifnikov or whatever. Anybody else? Yes, sir. If, if prices go below cost of production, how can we stay in business? If prices go below the cost of production, how can we stay in business? You can stay in business a variety of ways because you have opportunity to, to buy and purchase puts, to put floors under the market, and guarantee that doesn't happen. You can talk to these smart guys from UFC or the programs that they offer like uh, who, who is it? Uh, ADM. ADM programs. Those types of things if you don't feel comfortable marketing it yourself. But this is not a year to say, I'm just going to worry about marketing later. It'll take care of itself. This is a year you want it. We've had a wonderful price appreciation for three months. You want to take advantage of some of this, in my opinion. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Peterson.